Hey guys, I thought I'd make a quick video on what I would look out for when buying a used car. Now I'm gonna use the High Super Custom as an example because it's what I have. And it's a car that I get a lot of questions about from people all over the world. People that are looking to buy or import one of these and they wanna know what to look out for. And I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier because people message me and they say, what should I look out for in the engine? What should I look out for with the body? Um, and I've never actually thought until I got a message last night uh, as to do I have a video buying guide um, on one of these and what to inspect. And so in this video, I'm gonna cover everything that I would inspect on something like this, um, but it also applies to any older vehicle. Now, when I get friends and family members messaging me about used cars that they wanna buy, it's usually pretty basic. I normally say, make sure it's got plenty of tread in the tires, make sure it's service and logbooks are up to date, make sure the windscreen's not cracked and run like a PPSR report to make sure there's no finance uh, owing on it, there's no flood damage and it hasn't been written off. Uh, but when it comes to something older like this, it's a little bit more in depth because chances are it won't have its original service logbooks. And if you're importing it, chances are you won't have any history on the car as well. So it's up to you then to use your sensors and have a good poke around to figure out the history of the car, how it's been kept, and its current condition, and also things that you might need to do if you do decide to buy it. So I've purposely uh, not bought any tools with me, including a jack, and it's not because I'm lazy, it would have taken me 20 seconds to jack this up. The reason is not everyone is mechanically competent or experienced with vehicles, and what I don't want is anyone inexperienced to go out and inspect someone else's car and start using tools on that car especially jacking it up because for those inexperienced it can be dangerous to yourself and others and also you can damage someone else's car. So all you're going to need for this is a flashlight and your hands and maybe some gloves. Now on a side note we are filming in a cemetery today and the reason for that is well it's beautiful it's quiet uh, I don't have a garage or a driveway to film in so I found the quietest place I possibly could. And it's this nice, serene cemetery. We may be asked to leave, hopefully not. And also, you better give this video a thumbs up, even if you don't like it, because I'm parked on dirt, and that means I'm gonna have to get under into the dirt for you guys. So we're gonna be breaking this video up into four parts. First, we're gonna start off with the mechanical side of things. Then we're gonna move on to the exterior. Then the interior, and finally, we're gonna drive it that should give us a really good understanding of where the car is. Now, if there is something minor wrong with your vehicle, that's okay. These are old vans and old cars in general. So chances are it's not gonna be immaculate. The difference there is how much it costs, how much it's going to cost to repair it, and can you get the car a little bit cheaper to make sure that it's fully up to spec. Also, everyone has a different level of standard that they find acceptable. For me, I love cars, I'm a car enthusiast, and I'm obsessed with maintenance, literally. So my car has to be immaculate, and I guess that gives you a really good understanding of what a really good Super Custom looks like, both underneath in the engine bay, how it drives, how it looks, how it feels, uh, for you to compare against the vehicle that you're going to buy. So let's get started with number one, mechanical. So first thing we're gonna look at is the brake fluid. That lives on the right hand side of the driver's dash panel. To check it, you simply put your finger in here and pop it out. And then in there, you have your brake fluid reservoir. Now it should be transparent and nice and clear and obviously in between the max and the minimum line. And also, the reason this will go down to about here at the acceptable level of normal use is as your brake pads wear, the caliper pistons need to push out further to engage the brake rotor or the brake drum. And so because there is a further amount of travel for the brake piston itself, it needs more fluid. So this will eventually come down to about this line. If it's dropping below that line, you obviously have a leak in the system or something isn't right with it. But make sure that it's transparent and up to the full line or up to this dotted mark here and also that there isn't a visible difference in two types of fluid. Like if you mix water with oil, you will see that water will sit 
uh, at the top and oil will sit at the bottom or vice versa. You wanna make sure that everything is just one solid fluid because brake fluid is hydroscopic, not hydrophobic. So it loves water. It will attract water and absorb it. To put the cap back on, just look at it. So this one has a tab on the bottom and then a clip on top. So this one obviously needs to go up first and then just push it in. Done. Next, we're gonna move over to the engine bay. And to access the engine bay on the Hyatt Super Custom, you open your passenger door. There is a secondary latch under this cup holder and then the primary latch under the carpet here. So I always undo the secondary first and just get it out of the way. You may need to pull it just to get the carpet out. And then the primary. Tilt it up. Lift this flap up. It's hard to do it with one hand. And then push down on the main latch and it'll just pop open like that. Up here, you'll have this plastic strap that will hold the engine bay cover up. So it's kind of difficult to do this with one hand. So I'm gonna put the camera down, grab my little latch, bring this down, and clip it in. So now, our engine bay cover is up. So what do you want to look for under the engine bay? First things first, do not open the radiator cap if the car's been running. This car's just been running, so I'm not going to open it because I don't want to burn myself. And it's been a while since I looked at my engine bay and there is quite a bit of sand and dirt in here, so it does need a clean. So, first things first, what I want you to do is squeeze the radiator hose. It should be nice and supple or nice and firm if the car's been driving for an extended period of time. This one is soft, and what you're looking out for is any crunching noises or crunching sensation inside the hose. That crunching noise or sensation is a layer of crust and rust built up inside the entire cooling system, including the rubber hoses. So feel the top hose, you can do it with the reservoir cap, you can get hand in down somewhere and squeeze a heater hose uh, or even the lower radiator hose that buildup of crust tells you that the vehicle has not been maintained very well, at least the cooling system. And what you've just done is dislodge a whole lot of solid particles into your liquid cooling system. So goodbye heater core. If you do decide to buy the vehicle, you will absolutely need to remove every single hose and clean it out or replace it. Remove the thermostat and then run at least two bottles of radiator flush treatment with distilled water in your cooling system for at least a couple of days. That will dissolve all of the rust and corrosive particles, and then you'll need to repeat the process, this time putting in a new thermostat, ideally a new water pump at the same time, and then filling it up with the right antifreeze mix. So next up, I'm gonna grab my little torch for this. You should always have a flashlight in the car. These are so cheap off eBay, like $23. They come with two batteries, battery charger, and you can recharge it just by micro USB. So I'm gonna grab yourself a flashlight, bring it over to your radiator reservoir tank. You might not be able to see this, but I can. And you wanna make sure that the coolant is at the full mark. It could be in between the full and low mark. I guess that's normal, but you're looking for a car that's been very well maintained. And a well maintained car will always have its coolant at its full mark. If it's been driving, it'll be further up depending on how much the system is pressurized. But ideally you want the coolant between the full and low mark. You also want the coolant to be bright and translucent. This is bright red because I run red coolant. If it's green, you want the coolant to be bright green. You do not want your coolant to be black or darkened. Now, if the engine is cold, you can open the radiator cap and look for any crust built up around the radiator cap. 
and just make sure that the coolant here matches the color of the coolant in the reservoir tank because you don't want someone uh, who's about to sell a car just to put some nice fresh coolant in here um, and then you'll look in there and think oh well that looks great but in here it could be all rusty brown okay next thing is the engine oil you want to undo the engine oil filler cap and check for any white milky substance underneath the cap there. There is none whatsoever on this one. Make sure that the seal is good. You can see that there's some oil around that. Give it a smell. I know it seems weird, but you just want to smell clean engine oil. It's okay for diesel engine oil to be black. Uh, it doesn't have to be black, but it's okay for it to be black. Now you can get rid of that black engine oil sort of sensation inside your engine uh, just by doing two engine oil changes within like two hours of each other. So you're basically carrying away all of the soot inside the engine so that all that's left is clean engine oil and it will stay clean for the entire duration of the service interval. Uh, I haven't done so on this one yet, but I will be doing it eventually. So next up, obviously you wanna check your engine oil level, pull your dipstick out, wipe it off, make sure the car's on level ground, make sure that the car has sat for a while so that all the engine oil can come back into the reservoir, pull it out. I might seem a bit awkward doing this because there's a camera in the way. And obviously you want it between the low and high marks. So on this car, even though it's dripping oil everywhere, the mark for full is right here and it's a bit over which is not too bad and the low mark is here so you want it in between that and if i wipe this off now you'll be able to see it better there you go low and full and on these dipsticks most toyotas have and this is how you can tell a quality vehicle from a cheaper vehicle it's little things like this this is a metal dipstick Try pulling the dipstick on a Honda. They're all plastic. So obviously this will last a lot longer than the Honda's dipstick. So what I'm trying to show you here is on the dipstick, the manufacturer will normally stamp the engine oil grade to use. So here it's 1530. I run 10W40 because I live in Australia where it gets pretty darn hot. And our winters are pretty cool as well here. So 10W40 full synthetic for my car and it seems to love it. Doesn't burn any oil whatsoever. While we're in the engine bay, just give your fuel filter primer a gentle push. It should be firm. It shouldn't push down easily. This is nice and firm. You don't want to jump on this like an ape because you don't want to overpressurize it. It's just there to drag fuel from the, end, from the fuel tank up to the engine. That's all it's there for and bleed the system. So it's nice and firm, that's good. We'll check our power steering fluid while we're here. Pull it out, make sure it's nice and clear and trans, uh, translucent. There'll be a cold and a hot mark. If the car's been running, that means it's hot. And obviously you can see mine is up to the hot mark. If you just wipe it on a clean part of your rag, it should be nice and clear like that. Before you put it back, give the cap a bit of a wipe down. Just as good practice, because as you can see, the car's been off-road. It's got some sand all over the engine. You don't want sand going into your reservoirs because they will eat up your seals. So next up, I've removed the tripod from my camera and we want to have just a general inspection of the fuel filter. Does it look fairly new? Is it clean? Is it caked and years and years worth of dirt? And what brand filter is there? Also, what brand filter is the oil filter? That will give you some sort of uh, general history as to where or how the car was maintained. Are they quality parts? Are they OEM? Are they reputable brand names like Sakura or Ryko? Or are they just cheap, unknown brand filters? Because that will tell you who maintained it and what sort of budget they had. And so next up, what I've been putting off because it's gonna be difficult to do with a camera in the way, is checking the automatic transmission fluid. You wanna use a clean towel for this. And this is the one that gets people because to check the correct level of automatic transmission fluid, the engine has to be running. Um, I often don't, I just let it be as is and check it while it's off. 
because I, I can grasp whether it's going to be low or full. And if the car's not leaking oil, if the transmission isn't leaking oil, uh, and the cooling system is okay, you know that the automatic transmission fluid will not decrease over time. There's no combustion happening in the automatic transmission, so your engine oil or your, your transmission fluid will not be burnt away. So to check the transmission fluid, there's a little tab here which you need to push out. It's very difficult to do with one hand, so I'm going to do it with two. You do not want the dipstick to touch any dirty parts of the car and just pull it out and have a general look at its condition. So mine is at the full mark perfectly. And if I give it a wipe, you want to see it being nice and red and translucent, which this one is. The bit of dirt that's on there is from the dipstick itself. So I'll wipe that clean. All I'm looking for essentially here is a nice, clear, translucent automatic transmission fluid. Just like the engine oil, I'm gonna sniff it. It should not smell burnt. It should smell, people say like cherry. It should just smell slightly sweet. It should not smell burnt at all. Trust me, you will know if it's burnt because you'll smell it. And then finally in the engine bay, I'm just gonna give it a really good inspection. Uh, to test whether your viscous fan hub is working, what you do is you uh, start the engine with the engine cover up, you turn the engine off, and if the fan stops when you turn the engine off instantly, it's essentially working. It should also feel nice and smooth, and you wanna push it back and forth, and there is no noise or movement in that whatsoever, except for the plastic fan blade, uh, which will indicate worn uh, bearings in the pulley. Next up, fan belts. You want to make sure that they're not frayed or ripped. Ow, hot. And you want to make sure that there's enough tension on there and that, again, there's no noise from pulleys or anything while you're twisting and pulling and pushing. Around the top of the engine, you want to make sure that there is no oil or diesel leaking around from the injection system, which are these parts here. There's no fuel sitting over there. There's a little bit of engine oil that's spilt uh, from when we did the service on the vehicle. And up the back here, you want to make sure that your automatic transmission kickdown cable is good, and so is your uh, throttle cable. Sorry, this is the automatic transmission kickdown, this is the throttle. Um, they don't have to be uh, completely firm and tight because this is a electronic controlled engine, so it doesn't rely on this. Uh, to realize when the throttle is open, um, the sensor will manage that itself. And then up the back, you've got some vacuum hoses. You want to make sure that they're not hard or brittle or cracked uh, and just give the vehicle a really good once over. So I don't see any oil leaks here. There is a little bit of seeping from the rocket cover gasket at the back, which isn't worth repairing as yet. So that all looks pretty good under here. It's all pretty tidy. It's what you'd expect from a vehicle that looks like it's about 12 years old, not 23 years old. Uh, also, these little vacuum hoses around here have a tendency to come off. Sometimes when people are working on these things, they might pull one of these hoses off to get access to something and just forget to put them on. So just make sure that everything is on there properly. Also, on your injector pump, this is the injection pump here. It is a very complicated uh, piece of mechanical and electrical engineering. People do do resistor mods and different modifications to this because it's electronically controlled to get some more power out of it. I don't recommend it. Um, I recommend doing other things to get more power out of your vehicle um, because the engineers that built this knew what it would withstand uh, in a broad range of conditions and climates. Uh, and tune the vehicle accordingly for long-term reliability and longevity. Um, with the injector pumps on uh, a lot of older Toyota vehicles or any uh, diesel vehicle coming out of Japan, in fact, is they begin to leak diesel. So you want to get your hands around it. And there is a screw I just found here. I have no idea what for, but someone obviously had been working on this car and dropped the screw. I'll pull that out if I can. Just 
pretty decently wedged in here. There you go. Oh, wonder what that's for. But the thing about a lot of these um, older diesels coming out of Japan is uh, before they get sold uh, to auction and then shipped off to wherever you are in the world, uh, a lot of times these will sit for months and months um, with uh, less and less use uh, as they lead up to being sold. And so sometimes they'll sit for a year or two even uh, without being started, maybe just run once in a blue moon, um, not very far for long distances. And because, well, most people don't run diesel fuel conditioner or cleaner in uh, the fuel tank when they fill up their vehicles, especially in Japan, what can happen is all of the seals in the injector pump can start to dry out. And when they dry out, they shrink and that lets air in and diesel out. Um, the only way to fix that really is to have the injection pump rebuilt, which can be, you know, in excess of $600 all the way up to $2,000. Uh, with labor to remove it, have it sent off, rebuild, reconditioned, put back, and then the labor to put it back in. And then obviously, while that's happening, you're gonna be doing a whole lot of other work because the front of the engine cover is gonna be off, uh, this timing belt cover, and you may as well be doing the timing belt, the water pump, etc. So it ends up being quite a hefty bill. So just make sure that it's not leaking any diesel from the injection pump itself. Um, also, I forgot to mention the timing belt. Uh, so, if you just want to replace a belt on these things, it takes about 20 minutes and it's not very expensive at all. But it is recommended to get the complete kit which has oil seals that go behind the pulley for the crankshaft, the camshaft, sorry, the crankshaft and the camshaft. Um, it comes with some new pulleys. You can always get new bearings for these pulleys as well. Uh, you may as well replace the fan belts at the same time um, and just do the complete thing with the water pump as well. So. Uh, you want to check the date. Every timing belt will always have a sticker that comes with it and any reputable uh, mechanic will always fill out that sticker and put it on the engine so you know when it was last replaced and when it needs to be replaced next. So it tells you here in Japanese, replace timing belt uh, every 100,000 kilometers. And so this one was done at 96,000 kilometers um, on the 24th of September, 2016. Uh, this car's done 170,000 no, kilometers just now. Uh, it had done 158,000 kilometers when I bought it. Now, timing belts are good for about seven years. I've seen them at 10 years. They're uh, dry and brittle, um, so they can go up to 10 years, but ideally, you do not want to exceed seven years uh, with your timing belt, which works out fine for me because by the the time I've made my calculations, um, it's gonna be seven years when I hit uh, 200,000 kilometers on this vehicle. So perfect timing to get the timing belt done then. If your car doesn't have uh, a sticker, sometimes it'll always be in Japanese. Uh, what you can do is grab your phone, uh, open up Google Lens, uh, you can download the app, uh, take a picture of it and then click translate and it will translate everything for you uh, so you know exactly when it was done last. Underneath here, you have your battery tray. So this is where the battery lives on this vehicle. Remove that. Also, flip it over and make sure that there's no corrosion on the underside. The older, side, older style of batteries will have little caps on the top um, that evaporate uh, or vent corrosive vapors. Those vapors will come directly onto your battery tray and rust it out. So just make sure the rubber seal is okay and that there's no rust on that. Then you have your battery. There's not really a lot you wanna check. You just wanna make sure that the battery uh, clamp down is in place, that all of the electrical connections are nice and tight. There's no corrosion. The battery terminals itself, they're nice and clean. And that there is nothing untoward happening in here especially if the vehicle's been modified with aftermarket electronics, uh, spotlights, things like that, you might find a nest of untidy wiring down here which you may need to address and you can definitely look at that and get a grasp of how the vehicle's been modified and who did the wiring. Does it look nice and tidy? Is there a standalone fuse box fitted to it? Um, or is it just wires all over the place of different colors and sizes? Uh, so this one, um, in Japan, they normally write the date of the battery uh, being put into the vehicle. And so this one was put on on the 28th of December, 2018. 
So this battery should be good for about seven years total. Um, 19, 20, 21, I'm pretty dumb, I can't count. So I have at least three years of good service life out of this battery. Now when you put your battery cover back on, they're not always the easiest things. You just want to rock it around and make sure that it's seated well, and then you can put your tab in. And again, if you're inspecting someone else's vehicle that you want to buy, put everything back the way you found it. Just do a nice tidy job, tuck the carpeting in. So that's it for the engine bay side of things for now. After you test drive the vehicle, ideally uh, you would stop um, after an hour or two of driving it, open the engine bay up again, take a look at the coolant level, is the reservoir filled up uh, as it should do, which means that the system is pressurizing uh, and working as it should be. Um, and also you just wanna make sure that you open the engine oil filler cap again and check for any milky residue, just in case someone's cleaned it before you got there. So just make sure that you check those things and in the engine bay at least, you should be fine. So next up is the other part of uh, the mechanical inspection on this vehicle. And that is the suspension, front and back, and the underbody. So the ball joints on these vehicles uh, are a part of the upper control arm. If you have aftermarket upper control arms, they won't have grease nipples on them. Original upper control arms have factory zerk fittings or grease nipples. Um, so that way you can grasp whether the upper control arms have been done or not. Now to check for wheel bearing play uh, and also for ball joints is to jack the vehicle up and get a pry bar underneath it and give it a wiggle. Now I did mention that I didn't bring a jack and not everyone is competent enough to jack up a vehicle and get in there with a pry bar. Uh, so, when we do test drive the vehicle, you will be able to hear any clunking noises and then you can isolate it from there on or then decide to dig a little further uh, by jacking the vehicle up. But we're not going to be testing any sort of wheel bearing play um, by lifting the vehicle up today. Uh, we're just going to use our ears when we test drive the vehicle later on. When it comes down to things like brake pads and rotors, uh, wear and tear on those, I don't really fuss too much about them because they're consumable items that are relatively cheap to buy regardless of where you are in the world. Uh, so if it does need brake pads, you know, in a couple of months time, it's not gonna be the biggest deal in the world. What you do wanna look for uh, on the wheels itself is for any bends or buckles uh, or cracks if it's got aluminum wheels. So just make sure you go around it, make sure that all of the wheel nuts are in place, uh, make sure that there's no cracks or hairline cracks or bends or buckles in the wheels itself and just give each wheel nut a bit of a wiggle and also the four-wheel drive hub on the front if you are buying a four-wheel drive vehicle. Now when you check for tires, um, again like the brand of oil filters and fuel filters used, uh, without checking the tread or anything like that, you can always get a grasp of who owned the vehicle uh, and how it was maintained previously by the brand of tires fitted to it. Are they reputable names or are they just random, unknown, off the shelf tires that no one's ever heard of? Uh, the, the most budget orientated tires whatsoever. So if they've got some decent brand name tires like Kumho, Continental, um, BF Goodrich, etc., you know that the vehicle's had some money spent on it and that the previous owner didn't mind spending a little bit extra to get some quality items put in. Just like the fuel filter, uh, and the oil filter. And then again, checking for tread wear. Uh, this, these tires are pretty much brand new, but you wanna make sure that firstly, it's got enough tread on there. Uh, every country is a bit different, but it's usually 1.3 millimeters as the minimum legal depth. Um, also, you wanna make sure that the tread wear is even throughout. You don't want the insides wearing, you don't want the outsides wearing, you don't want the center wearing, uh, which could indicate a bad wheel alignment setup or uh, running incorrect tire pressures. So if you run under inflated tires, uh, the outside edges will wear and the inside will not because the sidewall, the strongest part of um, what holds the tire together basically, is uh, taking the, the weight of the vehicle. And so the outside edges wear. 
if it's overinflated, the tire sort of cups out like that instead of bowing out like that. And so the center will be worn away. Um, you want to make sure that all of the tread depth is about the same on all of the different tires. And the reason for that is if they're, um, if they have the same tread pattern, uh, that means that they should be rotated around different parts of the car. So if, you know, the front tires are completely worn and the back tires are the same brand and the same style, but they're, they're only half worn or they look basically brand new, it means that the vehicle's uh, tires have never been rotated. So little things like that will tell you uh, how the vehicle is maintained in its previous life. So what I've been dreading is next up, you have to get under the vehicle. Uh, so I'm gonna start off at the front and work our way back. So firstly, hopping under it at the front here, you wanna make sure that the structure behind the bumper is nice and straight, making sure that there's no dents, dings, or obvious welds where there shouldn't be welds uh, that would indicate that the vehicle's been in a front end collision at some point. And do the same for the back bumper as well. Make sure that the support behind the plastic bumper is all complete and all in the same condition as other parts of the vehicle, which will indicate that it hasn't been in an accident. So moving on, you have your secondary radiator up the front here when we're talking about the high super custom. Again, you want to make sure that there is no visible leaks in the under protective shroud and obviously make sure that this protective shroud is in place uh, and just have a really good poke around at the radiator itself. Are all the fins nice and open or are they all bent in certain parts indicating bad workmanship or someone that's been in there doing something. These radiators, both of them, the main radiator and the auxiliary has uh, plastic tanks. So you wanna make sure that there's no cracks in those tanks, that they're not aged and you'll see little sort of uh, crow's nest cracks uh, forming around them. Just make sure that the radiator uh, tanks are in good condition like this one is. There's no cracks in it, there's no leaks in it and the radiator shroud is in place. This also acts as a venturi uh, to get air in, through, and around the, the radiator to make sure that it can keep itself cool. So, two purposes, you wanna make sure that this is here. Uh, secondly, looking down the chassis rails of the vehicle, you wanna make sure that firstly, they're not completely corroded, uh, and secondly, that they're symmetrical on both sides. Above the second radiator, you have your air conditioning condenser, which is this piece here. And again, you wanna make sure that there's no visible leaks and that uh, everything is bolted down and just looking tidy as it should be. So the higher Super Customs have a lot of grain channels in and around the body. Uh, you'll find these hoses throughout the underbody and you wanna make sure that they're in place and that they're not blocked up with dirt or gunk and that they're clear and you can see through the inside of them because that will indicate that if there's a whole lot of mud or something, the car's been through um, a lot of serious off-roading, mud's gone in through the roof and around the windscreen and things like that and traveled into these drain channels so you might want to give the car a really good wash if you can't see through them on the passenger side uh, underbody at the front you have your um, windscreen washer reservoir so again make sure there's no cracks make sure it's not leaking anything because you do need your windscreen washer and uh, in most parts of the world that is a legal requirement as well so moving back you can see the main cross member support or the subframe for the vehicle uh, so you might or may not have this little venturi uh, thing here which basically just directs airflow uh, and acts as a stone guard as well uh, so above that is the main subframe which holds your engine um, and your front diff in place so again you're just looking for any wet spots any leaks any rust any corrosion has the vehicle been scraping its underbelly all over the place because you will see it underneath this one's got a little bit of scrape there which is my fault uh, but 
you want to make sure it's not caked up full of dirt and dust and mud and clay and sand because if these vehicles are taken off road uh, more intensely than they're designed for uh, you will see a whole mound of mud and dirt because they scrape their underbellies and this part here just gets absolutely caked in dirt uh, so trust me i know that from experience uh, and then moving out to the uh, suspension arms you want to make sure that again they're symmetrical one side is not higher than the other one You want to make sure that they're not rusting away, uh, which will indicate that the car has been driven on the beach quite often and not washed properly. And then moving in on both sides, you want to check that the boots on uh, the lower ball joints and the CV drive shafts are in place. A split boot will destroy your CV drive shaft in no time. And while you're at it, have a good poke around and look at the shock absorber and on the lower part of the shock absorber, you wanna see that it's nice and dry, just as dry as the top part, which will indicate that it's not leaking any oil uh, and it should be in acceptable condition. Again, you also wanna make sure that there's no stone chips, no dents or no rust on your shock absorbers. And then being underneath the vehicle gives you a good chance to have a look at the tire wear uh, and just how the tires are sitting on the ground. Just make sure that you check both sides as well. On the driver's side, uh, underbody at the front here, you have your ABS uh, braking system. So you wanna make sure that this system, which is a combination of mechanical and electrical components is nice and dry, that the pipes and, and the hard lines themselves are not corroded away uh, because brake fluid is corrosive. Uh, and you wanna make sure that everything is just looking pretty factory. Get your hands in there, have a good poke around and a feel. You do not want to feel any bit of liquid around this component here. Uh, so inside the wheels, you wanna make sure looking at the inside barrels and the backing plate of the brake disc, which is this uh, black piece here, and there's a few holes in there for ventilation. You wanna make sure that that's nice and dry because the only fluid that will uh, end up around there is brake fluid. Unless of course it's been raining, but uh, you absolutely do not want to see any moisture uh, uh, around the backing plate or sitting on the bottom of the wheel rims itself. And if the wheel rims aren't clean like this, uh, you can always just uh, run like a rag or something across them or your fingers if you're brave enough. Um, and it should just be dry brake dust. It should not have an oily, uh, component to it, which will indicate um, brake fluid leaking. So that's it basically from the front end uh, as, in terms of a, a basic inspection. So we're now gonna move to the middle of the vehicle and on the higher Super Custom, it's uh, a little bit tricky because there's a lot of protective underbody paneling underneath the car, uh, which makes it a little bit difficult to inspect, but I'm gonna give it a shot anyway. Oh man, I'm gonna get freaking dirty as. So now we're at the underbody side uh, in the middle of the vehicle and lying down, we have our air conditioning lines for the standalone rear air conditioning system. You wanna make sure, again, it's not corroded. Uh, this one has not been cross-threaded or, or, and, and all the sides of the nuts are nice and straight, which means that no one's really been in here uh, doing any work. Uh, that, that didn't know what they're doing. Uh, on the main structure uh, on the body of the vehicle, because this is a monocoque vehicle, uh, it uses subframes and uh, the chassis is incorporated to the actual uh, body of the vehicle. Although it's, it's very close to being a, a body on frame um, because you can see the, the thick chassis rail here. Uh, but you wanna make sure that down the sides, especially where the, the sliding door is, it is nice and straight. Um, you know, if this part was really badly dented up, this one has obviously been on a curb or something here, but if this part was really crushed in, uh, you know the vehicle's been used uh, severely off-road um, where it shouldn't have been. And uh, you might see some uh, surface rust. This is actually um, mud, uh, but you wanna make sure that there's no rust underneath here, and especially behind this uh, little panel here because uh, this can collect sand uh, if the car's been on the beach and hasn't been cleaned properly, 
and it will eat away uh, at this part here. And it's very common for these vehicles to rust around here on uh, especially the sliding door side, but also the other side as well. Uh, what you're looking, what I look for is just a general um, overview of all of the parts of the car and how uh, similar they are all together. So I can see that the protective paneling here uh, matches the color to the protective paneling here and the front and at the back as well. What I'm trying to say is just in general, you want to make sure that everything is consistent with the vehicle. Uh, so underneath here, you have your automatic transmission oil pan and then above it, obviously, it's bolted to the automatic transmission. Again, you just want to see it dry. You can get further in underneath the vehicle if you want. Um, and if you're really brave and if the owner will let you, you can remove uh, this cover here, which is held on with a bunch of uh, 10 or 12 mil bolts, um, which will give you superb access to see the transfer case and the automatic transmission. Uh, but if a gearbox um, or transfer case or engine is leaking, it will always drip down due to gravity uh, on the bottom here. And you will be able to see, like I said, consistency if the vehicle has been scrubbed up in one area. Uh, because even the most committed dodgy seller will not scrub up the entire underbody. So you will be able to see if someone's cleaned a certain component. So again, you're just looking for any leaks, any signs of weeping or seeping, uh, but this one is completely dry. And it's also dry if you look uh, further up into the automatic transmission itself. Uh, the transfer case lives on the passenger side as well. Uh, so this is the transfer case here, uh, bolted to the engine. Again, no leaks, no seeping. Uh, where the front drive shaft meets, uh, you absolutely don't want to see any oil here because it's just a simple oil seal behind this, so it's not the end of the world if it is, uh, but you don't want to have any oil leaking here. And that it's very thick, heavy gauge uh, protective uh, shield is bolted on and present. So moving forward, uh, you have the underbody of the engine side itself uh, from the back. Uh, previously, we were facing backwards um, at the front of the vehicle. Now we're in the middle facing forwards. Again, underneath that cross member, you don't want to see any oil or, or engine oil leaking. If that was wet, if the components underneath this protective panel are wet as well, it would indicate an oil leak uh, from the engine uh, where it bolts up to the automatic transmission. Can be a big job because you have to separate the automatic transmission to get to the oil seal, uh, which uh, usually costs quite a bit of money. And then you've got your front sway bar here at the back of the front wheels. You want to make sure that if you can get your hand in it and give it a wiggle up and down, you do not want to hear any sort of uh, empty void in space there. So I've recently replaced uh, these bushes so there is no uh, movement of this. But these, when these bushes wear out, they're very cheap to buy and replace at $30 for a pair delivered. So really you can't afford to replace these every couple of years. But if you can feel, even if it's just worn about two millimeters, you can get your hand under it and give it a good wiggle and you will feel it move if it is worn out. But it's just, again, giving you a rough idea of the overall condition of the vehicle. You can see the red bushes up there, they're polyurethane, which I've had replaced recently. Um, so this one's all in good shape. But where these red bushes are, uh, are usually just rubber bushes and um, they clamp down with quite a bit of force. So you will see them split around the actual circle itself if they are worn. Alrighty, uh, moving back to the rear of the vehicle, further back in the mud for you guys. Uh, this is a very common rusting uh, component of these vehicles. This uh, rear lower control arm or crailing arm uh, will often rust out on these vehicles and you want to make sure that this entire structure itself is nice and solid and has no visible rust spots and again um, Toyota makes it easy for you even if someone paints it and, and masks it up you can always look inside it to make sure that there is absolutely no rust because when these fail due to rust uh, causes a very serious failure and uh, can be very very unsafe at the back of the vehicle, you're looking at the springs, similar things from the front. You want to look inside the, the wheels to make sure, especially in the back where there's drum brakes, that there is no liquid seeping because the, the drum brake cylinders tend to leak um, more commonly than the disc brake cylinders on the front. So 
Again, on both sides, you want to make sure that there is absolutely no seepage of brake fluid, uh, because otherwise you will have to get new shoes, usually new drums, and obviously um, brake cylinders for the rear. And again, just checking over everything, making sure that the handbrake cable is nice and secure. It's running through its little loop here, that no one's played around with it and forgot to put it through the loop, and it's just uh, an empty cavity here. Again, all your suspension components give them a nice wiggle uh, to make sure there's no play. And the thing about suspension components is you'll feel um, movement in it, obviously, but it'll be a hollow movement, kind of like dig, 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 dig. I know that sounds weird, but it'll also make a sound. Coil springs are very reliable. They, they almost never fail. Uh, but again, you just want to make sure consistency of the vehicle, that they're not rusty, that they're not split, that a piece of the spring hasn't broken off the top and is sitting in the little cavity underneath here. And then uh, at the, the rear drive shaft, which is uh, probably one of the smallest drive shafts I've ever seen in a car, like we checked the front drive shaft, you want to make sure that there is no oil seeping uh, from where it meets the back of the transfer case, which is just a simple oil seal there, but again, it gives you an idea of how the vehicle is maintained if that's leaking. And again, the pinion seal where it meets the rear diff. And while you're at it, you have a look at the rear differential and make sure that the gasket's fine and that there's no leaks uh, coming from around the top uh, and bottom of the differential itself. Rear sway bar, you can do the same with the front grab it, give it a good tug. Uh, you shouldn't feel any dead spots or, or movement in that whatsoever. That's, that's basically supporting the entire lateral force of the vehicle. So uh, you shouldn't be able to manipulate that at all with your hands. With the rear drive shaft, uh, I won't demonstrate it to you, but you wanna lie underneath the vehicle and you wanna push the drive shaft up and down at both ends, not side to side, up and down. There should be no movement and no hollow clunking noises uh, at all whatsoever there. And these uh, higher Super Customs will only have a grease fitting uh, on the front of the rear drive shaft only. Uh, so you, you do want to see a little bit of grease, um, maybe splatter or just a, a bit of wetness there, which is normal, which will indicate that someone has been greasing the drive shaft at every service, which it, it, it should be done. The front drive shaft does not have any grease fittings. Uh, the reason for that is it's not a live axle. It's not a floating axle, whereas this entire axle will move up and down with every little bump in the road. So this slip joint here will slide in and out as uh, this axle drops down and gets further away from the actual car. So it needs that grease there. The front drive shaft and the front diff don't move. They're held steady in place and it's just the CV joints or on each uh, wheel that go up and down. Uh, so that doesn't need grease, it's grease for life. Um, and like I said, the other grease points on these vehicles are the uh, ball joints on the front, upper control arm. Uh, they, the original ones have grease fittings, the aftermarket ones do not have grease fittings on them. So just something to keep in mind. So moving on to the back of the vehicle now, gonna get under it. And you're looking for basically the same things as we checked on the front. Uh, is the shock absorbers dented? Are they rusting? Are they wet at the bottom? Which will indicate leaking shock absorbers. Again, you can have another good look underneath the car and see if uh, the backing plate for the rear brakes are wet and the bottom of the wheel rims, because no matter where the wheel rim is, uh, will be wet if the, the wheel cylinders are leaking. Have a really good look at the differential, make sure there's no leaks coming from the fill or the drain plug, uh, which is often seen as something minor, maybe just a new uh, crush washer, but sometimes it could be cross-threaded and uh, end up being a bit of a nightmare. Uh, again, you wanna check the back of the trailing arms to make sure that there's no corrosion there. And uh, this is your fuel tank here above the spare tire, and it's made of steel. You want to make sure that there's no dents because if the vehicles are used severely off-road uh, sometimes they can drop down onto a rock or something push this in and all of a sudden you lose like four to ten liters of fuel capacity uh, again have a really good poke around not just at the underbody but you're looking at all the little things at the top as well making sure that there's no wet spots uh, which will indicate a leak in the fuel tank have a look at your spare tire 
Uh, tires are something on older vehicles that uh, you shouldn't really worry about. They're, obviously they're quite, quite an expensive outlay, but you wanna make sure that the car is mechanically sound and rust free, relatively rust free, uh, because tires are, are things that can easily be replaced. Mechanical components on older vehicles like this um, cannot be easily replaced or cheaply replaced if it's severe enough. But while you're at it, have a look at the spare tire carrier, make sure that it's all in place, make sure it has its little tangs here to hold the spare tire in place so it doesn't rock about and uh, uh, play uh, wreak havoc with your fuel tank. And then have a look underneath it to make sure that uh, it's not rusted or corroded. Uh, a little bit of surface rust is fine, uh, but again, the, these parts are not uh, remanufactured. Uh, so you can't get aftermarket spare tire carriers. Uh, it's in my opinion that um, for little things like this, uh, you don't uh, drop it down on uh, cement or concrete or asphalt and scrape the paint away uh, around here repeatedly because it'll rust away and because they're not making these anymore. You wanna make sure that you look after these simple little components on your vehicle so that you still have them uh, in the future. When you do look at your spare tire, uh, just, you know, it's, it's Id ideal to have a tire pressure gauge with you just to check the pressure on it. Uh, I like to mount the spare tires with the rim facing outward. That way I can always check and inflate my spare tire every sort of six months or so. Um, but usually they're mounted with the rim facing upwards towards the fuel tank. And uh, if that's the case, then more often than not, when, when you need the spare tire, it's flat because who really pulls out their spare tire methodically every six months and, and inflates it? So I like to orientate it this way. That way I can always check the pressure and make sure that it's uh, got some air in it when I will need it the most. And I like to inflate the spare tire up to like 45 PSI um, because over six months time, that will drop down to about 38 PSI. I run 38 PSI in my, my tires all the time on the road. Um, and I'd rather have more in it uh, if I need it uh, to drop it down than to have only 38 PSI in it and then have that drop down to like 30 PSI um, over, over a few months. So you wanna check the exhaust system. Oh, I'm really committed to this now, aren't I? So while you're in the, in the middle of the vehicle on the passenger side, you would've had a, a look at that big chunky muffler there. Um, you want to make sure that that's not corroded. Toyota exhausts are, are remarkably well built. Um, they never seem to rust out regardless of how, many, how old the vehicle is, provided it hasn't been used on the beach and not cleaned properly. This is the original exhaust from the car. It is relatively rust free and uh, you can follow the exhaust pipe all the way to the back. It is a, a complete bolt on exhaust, so it's not, um, if, it, if it's been changed, uh, it won't have the, the bolt on flanges uh, for different parts of the exhaust, say this is the back box and the, the muffler itself. Um, most custom exhausts, they'll just weld everything together um, and it'll just be maybe two pieces, but the original exhaust will have complete sections that are bolt on. Again, making sure that the bolts aren't rusted through, which will indicate the vehicle's been used uh, near the seaside, near the docks, near the ocean, or driven on the beach. And so when time comes to replace certain components, um, bolts will be rusted through. Again, like I'm saying, it's the overall condition of the vehicle. You want to make sure that not one thing stands out, that it's all basically consistent. That the back muffler is nice and rust free. Um, and this one's got an aftermarket exhaust tip uh, fitted to it. And at the back of the vehicle, you will find quite a few drain uh, tubes, like I mentioned in the front. Uh, the cavity for this one is feeding to my tow bar wiring but essentially you just wanna make sure that the drain tubes are there, that they're nice and clean. And looking up uh, to the floor, the body of the vehicle, you wanna make sure that uh, there's no hidden rust spots around those drain tubes, because if they get blocked, uh, water, silt, salt can uh, basically sit there and rust those areas out. And looking at the rear chassis frame of the vehicle, um, you wanna make sure it's nice and straight. This one's got the tow bar fitted to it. Um, so I know it's nice and straight. Like we checked the front, of the vehicle behind the front bumper. You want to make sure that the metal is nice and straight uh, looking towards the back of the car, that there's no pushed in bits or dents indicating that the car's been in an accident and they've just replaced the bumper. So again, we're looking at the other side of the chassis rail now, making sure that it's nice and consistent and referencing the, the other side, that it's nice and straight um, as well. And again, uh, you have little bungs like this here for uh, certain drainage components. 
this is underneath the driver's side of the vehicle. Uh, so this here is apparently a reservoir tank uh, that will filter out any water that comes into your um, air filter element housing. Uh, so this should be dry. If there's a little bit of moisture in it, it's not too bad, but ultimately this uh, reservoir should not have liquid in it. Again, from the, uh, might remove this from the tripod. From underneath the vehicle, uh, on the driver's side, you're basically looking for the same things. Uh, drain tubes, that they're in place, they're not blocked up. The air filter housing uh, is this uh, drum here. It'll have an arrow and uh, it'll say front uh, and it'll only fit basically one way. So you can undo this wing nut uh, just by hand. And uh, there's another wing nut on the same thread that holds the air filter in. That will give you a really good indication of how the car is maintained. If the filter is covered in crap and dirt, uh, or if the bottom of the filter is rusty and brown, it will tell you that the car's been off-road and that the air filter has been saturated with water before. Um, so uh, on the underside of this air filter housing as well, uh, you wanna make sure that this little uh, one-way valve is working properly. Um, sometimes they'll have a little bit of rust around here, uh, but ultimately you, you want the, the air filter housing to be rust free, uh, both on the inside and the outside, which will give you an indication of how the car is. So you're looking for the condition of the filter, um, whether it looks relatively clean or dirty, and also the condition of the housing itself. Again, uh, you're looking at the exhaust system itself from this side um, and a bit of view of the transmission and the transfer case here. Again, you're looking for any leaks, weeps, seeping. Uh, this is the uh, cooling line for the automatic transmission. Uh, so this one uh, goes all the way up to the front. Uh, I believe this has uh, the cooling for the automatic transmission as part of the uh, radiator, but I could be wrong. I haven't poked around with this one yet. But again, you just want to make sure that there's no leaks around the threads, around the bottom gasket there, and where it meets the transfer case itself. And then looking up towards the bell housing, you want to make sure that underneath the bell housing, there's no drips uh, right around there, which could indicate a leaking um, torque converter or a bad engine seal at the back of the engine where it bolts into the bell housing. And basically you're just looking around the entire vehicle, the body again, the chassis rails down both sides. This isn't rust, this is uh, mud. Um, and you're just having a really good poke around to make sure that the body is relatively rust free and the chassis rails are again, symmetrical uh, on either side, the driver's side and passenger side, that it's not dented up, pushed in, that people haven't drilled uh, a whole bunch of different holes in it for no reason to mount you know, neon lights, things like that, which I have seen done on uh, even four drives. This, uh, the setup here, uh, you want to pay close attention to is uh, the rear heating system. So uh, this vehicle has uh, two heaters and two air conditioning systems. I showed you the AC lines on the um, passenger side. On the driver's side, you have your heater core lines. So you'll have an in and an out. Uh, you want to make sure again that the clamps are, are are good that the, the hose is in good condition so it's got a bit of mud covered on it um, you want to squeeze them to make sure that they're, they're relatively supple and pliable you don't feel any crunching in them now uh, this is the valve that controls the amount of uh, fluid that goes into the rear heater uh, it's just simply connected with a, a cable that is moved by the, the controller on the inside of the car at the back so again you just want to make sure that that's relatively free that that cable is in fact in place and that all of the heater lines and the hard lines are nice and dry. The, the rubber hoses are, are not leaking and nice and dry as well where it goes into the vehicle. So that basically sums up the mechanical inspection on the high Super Custom. Apologies for the raven crowing away up there. Uh, so in summary, what, what we've just checked is under the engine cover, we've checked all the fluid levels, we've made sure that nothing is leaking. Uh, that there's nothing untoward happening there, that there's no shiny bits that uh, would indicate work recently being done, if the owner hasn't uh, already explained that to you. We've also checked the tires, the brand of tires, the brand of oil filter and fuel filter that's on the vehicle. Uh, we've checked the air filter condition and the air filter housings condition. Is it rusty? Uh, is the air filter um, soggy at the bottom uh, and rusting around the bottom, which would indicate that the car has been uh, in deep water or muddy water? We've had a really good look uh, at the radiators, 
in the front, the air conditioning condenser, and making sure that the plastic shroud and the underbody protective panels are in place, that there's no wetness underneath the engine, underneath the gearbox or around the bell housing. Uh, there's no wetness or uh, leaking from the drive shafts, front and back, that there's no play in the rear drive shaft. Uh, the rear trailing arms that uh, hold the rear live link suspension in place, that they're not rusty, which is a, a common rust area from them, for them I should say, that the exhaust is uh, in place, that uh, all of its bolt-on sections are in place and, and that the bolts themselves aren't rusted through, uh, which would indicate that the car's been um, living near the seaside, uh, used at the docks or driven on the beach frequently that the inside underneath of the sills down the side where the sliding door is and on the other side is relatively rust free and clear of any salt and debris and that the, the rear of the vehicle, the suspension, uh, just like the front, the uh, shock absorbers aren't damaged, rusty or leaking, that the CV boots on the front and suspension boot covers are in place and intact um, and that also there's no leaks coming from the transfer case or the differentials and that the exhaust hangers and everything are in place, that the chassis rails are straight and symmetrical to one another, and that behind the front and rear bumpers, the crash structure or the supports are nice and straight, uh, indicating that the car hasn't been in a front or rear end collision and repaired badly or just um, had a new bumper uh, tacked in place. So that's basically what we've just covered. Uh, now we're gonna move on to section two, which is the exterior of the vehicle. Uh, so, uh, depending on how old your car is and how well it's been maintained and whether it's been resprayed or not, chances are if it's uh, got nice paint on it like this one, um, then at some point certain sections of the vehicle, it's safe to assume, have been resprayed uh, because uh, not everyone, um, not just uh, cleans a car and maintains it, but, but understands how to protect them properly. And, a lot of uh, technology has evolved over the years uh, when it comes to paint protection, waxes, coatings, things like that. And just the knowledge surrounding um, paint protection, waxing, sealing. Uh, before YouTube, you know, it was a, a specialist sort of niche environment. Not a lot of people knew the difference even between polish versus wax, um, which Australians still don't understand. Uh, so it's safe to say that if, if the paint looks pretty good, um, then at some point the vehicle would probably have been uh, touched up or resprayed. Another telltale sign uh, on a lot of these high super customs is around the back here. Um, it would usually have the model or the trim variant designation uh, normally printed here. So if you're looking at a pearl white over titanium bronze uh, painted vehicle like mine, for example, this color was basically only predominant in the living saloon variants that is also referenced by the brown velour interior and the wood grain dash, which was basically only uh, for the living saloon EX. So if the, the stickers are missing here, chances are this area has been touched up or resprayed because when the stickers come off, they've been on the car for a very long time. They don't come off cleanly like uh, newer, more modern stickers. And so sometimes they require polishing and or some paint work. Looking at the back of the car, it will tell you uh, the kind of life that it's lived if you look at the rear bumper. So a lot of times if the vehicle's been used for a lot, of, a lot of loading work and things like that, the rear bumper very easily gets uh, scratched up with its paint around here. Uh, and these are little things, you know, I've uh, managed to put a couple of scratches in it already myself but essentially you're looking again, like the rest of the vehicle for consistency. Does the, the bumper look really scratched up? And uh, is there little cracks and dents in it? Is the tailgate dented up? Things like that, which will tell you if the car's been used um, as a hybrid between cargo and passenger hauling, or did the, the owners not really give a shit about it and just slid things up on the bumper and stood on the bumper and taken all the paint off it. So we're gonna start off our exterior inspection from the front, working our way back. Uh, these are, are fairly high off the ground, but you wanna make sure that underneath the bumper that everything is symmetrical and that there's no sort of scratched up or cracked bits. You wanna make sure that there is no liquid inside 
your uh, fog lights on the bottom, which will indicate they've been opened and not sealed properly. Uh, behind this grill here uh, lives your horns. This one has aftermarket horns, but you wanna make sure, like the rest of the car that we looked in underneath, that there's no severe rust lurking in behind here, because this is what catches the brunt of uh, everything that is, is coming towards it and where it's been driven. So if it's been driven in salt um, or on the beach or near the docks, the structure behind here and the horns will often rust out. You can see a tiny bit of surface rust on vision here, but it's nothing to worry about. Another way to tell uh, if that's just been cleaned up is the bolts around here will rust that hold the fog lights in place. These bolts tend to rust out really rapidly. So you can tell if the vehicle um, has lived a life near the seaside or, or been near corrosive elements, uh, if these bolts are, are completely rusted through. So moving up, you wanna make sure that your headlights are nice and flush. Uh, oftentimes these vehicles are involved in minor front end collisions that um, make it so the headlights don't really sit flush anymore. So you wanna make sure that the gap around the headlight is relatively even and give it a push on one end and then give it a push on the other end. You don't wanna see the headlight moving whatsoever if it's not sitting properly. Also, these side panels is what you remove to access the headlight bolts. Just make sure that they're in place um, and that the shut lines on these are, are relatively wonky when it comes to the door side, but you wanna make sure that the shut lines are pretty even when it comes to the front balance and the bottom of the bumper, because that will indicate to you if the car's been in an accident. So again, the shut line on the door side is always a bit wonky. You can see it's much smaller here than here, but the shut lines on the bumper are very even. So next up, one of the big things on the Super Customs, these things have a lot of grain channels, uh, like I mentioned, and they all drain out to different little tubes around the vehicle. Uh, the common thing is if they rust out, um, or if the drain channels aren't working, I should say, then the parts that should be draining get clogged up and they start to rust. Biggest thing for the Super Customs is around the windscreen, predominantly around the bottom here. You will see visible signs of little bits of bubbling coming up, and that's a big job uh, to get that repaired. So this one has a lot of bug splatter on it, um, but you will see uh, obvious signs of bad repair work. Uh, around here if the drain channels aren't working properly on the car. There will be little bits of rust and little bits of bubbling coming up. To repair that, it's a big job. The windscreen has to come out, has to all be ground back, new metal has to be welded in place, uh, sanded off, ground off, um, primed, painted, and a new windscreen put back in. So keep that in mind, that could be a deal breaker if there is rust around the windscreen. We're gonna move our way back down the side of the car. Again, you just want to make sure with any car, not just a super custom, that it's nice and straight. There's no dents, there's no obvious uh, abnormalities. The sliding door isn't sticking out at the back or the front looking like it's, it's been left open. And you want to make sure that all the shut lines around the vehicle are basically the same. So that gap there is the same as the gap here. You can open the door up, put your hand on it, and give it a rock up and down like that. And you shouldn't feel any looseness or vagueness in the door. It should actually rock the entire vehicle. So this one's nice and solid. The door's uh, put on properly. And again, you wanna make sure that the door shuts stay where it should do. So if the door was just flimsily flapping around without actually stopping at its stops there where I can feel it. Um, that would indicate that something is not right inside the door stop mechanism itself. Again, have a look down the sides here. It's very common to have um, hairline cracks in the paint for all super customs or basically even Land Cruiser, any cars of this age. But you wanna make sure that there's no hidden bits of rust that is coming through here that someone's just painted up and masked over. It's very common to have rust on the underside of this um, drain sill here. This is uh, a common place for, for these vehicles to rust out. You will know if it's bad rust. A little bit of surface rust is okay. Uh, it is an old car and this is the weather strip where the door rubber seal meets. So it's always gonna be wet around here. And remember Japan is a, a hot 
a wet, humid country in the summer. So it will always have been subjected to quite a bit of water. Uh, to find a, a, an entirely rust-free vehicle with not even a speck of rust would be rather suspicious. Um, so yeah, moving on, again, you're looking at the door shut lines, making sure that it's all nice and even. And predominantly with the rear door, you wanna make sure that when it opens up, that it's nice and symmetrical. You don't want the, the back end of the door kicked out like that, which would indicate that at some point, someone's put some really wide wheels on the back and adjusted the door to come out because it's very hard to get these doors lined up and adjusted. Very, very difficult. Moving on, uh, the higher Super Customs again, uh, a lot of water drain channels, a little tiny hairline crack there with some rust, very normal. You'll find bits of silicon all over the car. Again, very normal. That was part of the manufacturing process. Um, you know, have a look at the inside door rail where the door slides. Again, is that nice and clean or is there a bit of grease in there? That's good. Uh, another big thing here is at the bottom, you'll have these um, pins. These are electronic pins that connect up with the other side of the door here and basically tell the door to pull itself closed um, and switch the light off on the dash uh, as well. So you wanna make sure that these are nice and clean and that they're not, they're not completely corroded or missing. Uh, these are very hard to come by and you wanna make sure that yours are in good shape if you're gonna buy the, the vehicle. With the door open, you can look on the outside of the sill that we checked when we looked at the underneath of the car, again, to make sure there's no rust coming through, bubbling through, um, and beneath this sort of trim panel here. These uh, panels here often um, misplaced, broken, or missing, so it'll be great if your van has both of them. Open them up, and you should have your original toolkit here, um, and your jack should be on the other side, sitting there. To remove the jack, you turn it back and unwind it, so it'll reduce the size of the jack. You can pull it out to put it back in. You put it in there, twist it so the jack comes out and it holds itself in place. Feel the door for its motion. Make sure it's not catching anywhere. Close it and here for that electronic motor to pull itself closed, which will tell you that the door mechanism is working properly. Again, coming back, we're just checking shut lines, making sure that they're relatively even, making sure that the inside crack for the door is not rusted out and corroded out, and it's giving the car an overall inspection. We're continually checking this um, drain channel here, the gutter, to make sure that there's no rust on the underside. And, forgot to mention, you want to check the inside of the wheel wells and the fenders uh, to make sure that there's no holes, that it's not rusting through. If it looks relatively clean and looks like it's got some fresh underbody coat or, or paint on it. Remember, a lot of people in Japan get their cars underbody coated, so it's pretty common to find that, but it look, if it looks pretty fresh, it may be worth uh, getting a screwdriver and just having a poke around to make sure that it's not hiding anything. These are the upper control arms that I was mentioning before. Um, the ball joint lives as part of that upper control arm. They're very expensive to replace, between $800 to $1,200 just for the parts alone. So you wanna make sure that that looks reasonably in good shape and that the, the rubber boots are in place as well. We'll do the same on the, the rear. We'll make sure that it's nice and solid that there's no bits of light coming through, which will indicate little bits of rust holes, and just make sure that the inner fender's in good shape. The fender hasn't been bashed up here, um, which will indicate oversized tires. Uh, and sometimes um, the inside fenders, especially on the front, on the backside here on the front, will be bashed in with a hammer or something, uh, crudely if someone wants to put big tires on without lifting the vehicle. So at the back of the car, just like the front windscreen, a lot of drain channels happening here that drain out to the side. Uh, I showed you the drain tube there before. Very common for the drain channels to get blocked up here as well. And the bottom uh, of the uh, rear tailgate screen glass will rust here very badly. So any tiny bits of rust, if you can get in here, just have a really good poke around, really good inspection. 
take the time on the glass areas of the car. Okay, so there's no bubbling here uh, and no bubbling happening around the rear wiper arm, uh, which will indicate the drain channels are working properly and it's not pooling up with water here and causing rust because this part will rust out completely. And um, more often than not, people will just refuse to, to repair it. You'll have to find a replacement uh, tailgate itself and just hope that it's in the right color. Otherwise, not only will you have to go through the massive ordeal of fitting it, um, but then you'll also have to get it resprayed in two colors because these are two-tone vehicles. So at the back, we already mentioned the bumper. Uh, like we check the lights at the front, give the tail lights a wiggle. This one's got a little bit of wiggle to it, which is pretty normal for these actually. Um, they're only bolted, they're screwed in with two uh, Phillips screws. So they'll wiggle a little bit, but they shouldn't rock around, which will indicate a broken um, plastic tang where the screw actually goes in and, and holds the light in place. Uh, that's basically it for the back of the vehicle. And down the driver's side, there's no openings. Uh, there's no doors or anything. So you just want to make sure that that's nice and straight as well. Have a good look down the side. You'll see any dents or anything popping in, which will indicate some damage to it. Make sure that everything's in place. If you want to be anal, you can make sure that the original mud flaps are in place. It will say Toyota on them. There's a lot of times that these get ripped off off-road and people will just put in generic black mud flaps. And again, just making sure that the glass is in good shape. These are little, um, buttons here it's basically where the screw goes into the other side this has got a thread inside it so the screw goes into this very common for these to rust out uh, they're metal um, so the paint cracks on them and they start rusting out especially on the roof which we'll get to next and then the driver's side this is the intake for the air filter this one's aftermarket it's chrome um, your one will most likely be black make sure that it's screwed in and not glued in again checking the the uh, rain gutter to make sure there's no rust underneath it, checking the driver's side door, making sure that there's no splits or cracks where it shouldn't be, indicating a botched repair, things like this here. This is a, a factory line here where it was um, welded in place and glued in place. These are very normal. These folds here uh, on the A-pillar are very difficult to replicate. So it's little things like this will tell you if the vehicle's been in a severe accident and badly repaired because to replicate these curves here would be a, an absolute nightmare. So the paint matches the outside, everything looks good. Uh, you can always pull back the, the protective rubber to make sure that there's no rust or anything happening there, that the paint matches as well. And again, just making sure that there's no rust or corrosion around the door mounts itself. Um, and on the bottom here, everything seems to be in place just as it would be if it was factory original. And then with the driver's door, we also want to rock this up and down. There's no movement there whatsoever, no hollow, hollowness to it. So that's that. Now we need to go up to the roof. And in the roof, we're going to be checking out the sunroofs. So we'll pop this up. And obviously you want to check the glass that there's no cracks or anything in the glass, especially around where the mounts are. So where the, the bracket is for this to actually lift up. Someone's applied quite a bit of force to it. As the glass gets older, you may not know, glass gets weaker every time you hit it. So it could crack there, but this one appears to have some sort of film over it as well. So it's not actually cracked. If you do see any marks, it's actually just a film. We'll open up both sunroofs. Rear number one. Now, if the owner of the vehicle that you're looking at doesn't want you to open the sunroofs, you know that there's a problem. So, we'll get to the inside before, but with the sunroofs open, you'll have two green lights there indicating uh, the rear sunroofs are open. So now we'll shut the car off. We'll hop inside it and stand up through the second sunroof here in the back, which will give you a really good uh, inspection of the roof of the car, 
make sure that everything is nice, make sure the paint's nice. It's not rusting away up here. Uh, these little tangs pop up when the sunroof is up, that's normal. And now you can have a look at the front of the car to check the sunroof and the front, the driver's compartment. What you're looking for is a buildup of leaves, debris, algae, or anything underneath the, the sunroof mechanism here, which will indicate that it's been left open um, and sitting not in the most ideal place. Also, this rubber seal should be nice and supple and soft, uh, and there should be no green algae or anything growing underneath it. These are the, the metal buttons that I was uh, talking about before on the side windows. The paint comes off them and they start to rust, just like this one is doing here. So uh, it's not a big deal. At some point, you can just unscrew it and um, clean them up with some sandpaper and respray them. But just make sure that, you know, it's, it's not so far gone that uh, you can't do anything with them. So again, just making sure sunroof glass is in one piece. There's no big cracks or anything. They're very hard to come by. Can't get new pieces of glass for this from what I understand. Otherwise, it's, well, if you can, it's very difficult. Um, and people don't like shipping these from Japan. So make sure that it's in good shape. And another tip, when you own the car, before you go into underground car parks, always best practice just to drop all the sunroofs, especially this one and the, the last one, which lifts up even further. So you're looking at the rain gutters that we looked at before on the underside, but now you're looking at the top of the rain gutters, making sure that they're not rusted through. There's no bits of corrosion on them. Both sides, these look very nice. Oh, where's the camera? Where am I pointing? There, both sides look nice. Now we can check the main sunroof, the, the Santa sunroof. This part here, again, will be filled up with leaves and dirt and debris if it's been left open underneath well, underneath things like this. And uh, they can get in places and, and clog things up. So you wanna make sure they're nice and clean. If they're not clean, but the sunroof is working properly, well, you know you've got some work to do when you get the vehicle. If it hasn't been open for uh, extended periods of time, you'll get algae growing in around here. Uh, so it'll be green and slimy. Again, uh, if the vehicle's not draining properly, there'll always be some moisture here. So see this little hole here? The water sits in here and it, it runs out through uh, specific drain channels to those little pipes underneath the car. Now make sure that these are nice and free uh, because they can wreak absolute havoc if it is leaking. Sunroofs are not watertight. People think they're watertight, they're not watertight. Uh, so you won't get water in the car unless these drain channels are completely blocked up. And then when it rains, water sits in here, gets higher, higher, higher has nowhere to go because it's blocked up, it'll come into the vehicle and fuck up your interior. So with that done, we can now have a look at the rear sunroof itself, making sure that the glass is intact, it's in one piece. Um, you can obviously get a ladder or something stand outside the car, uh, but you can always see that there's no major corrosion around the hinges here on both sides. Again, you're checking the the uh, drain rain gutter at the, on the sides of the car as well, but no major rust happening there. And it's this rear sunroof that gets a lot of algae build up in it as well. So it's always worth just to pull the seat and hop in there. Bit of a look around. Just to make sure that it's not full of gunk and crap. Uh, you will see algae built up up here if the sunroof hasn't been opened. And I'll show you on the outside as well. Um, if we just step out of the car and my microphone is broken so if we just step out of the car now come around to the side of the car this part here should be nice and clean there shouldn't be any rust here unless there's water sitting and pooling and it hasn't been draining properly um, and there shouldn't be any green algae or anything in here if there is then you know you've got some work to do a little uh little chain or cable that lifts it up uh, should also be free of rust and corrosion. So this one all looks pretty good. So now we've done the mechanical inspection, uh, we've done the exterior inspection of the car, and it's time to have a look at the inside and make sure that everything's working and looking in good shape. So we'll start off again um, at the front and work our way back. We'll start off on the front passenger side. So this is all where you don't really need to be an expert just a, a lot of common sense door rubber seals are they all in good shape are they all complete do they all follow the forms of the car 
and are they where they should be? Are they popping out in certain areas? Um, it's very hard to get door rubber seals. You can get aftermarket ones, but very hard to get them to fit just like original. Is the dashboard got a whole bunch of holes in it? Is there any plastic pry marks around the airbag itself or where someone might have tried to take this cover off, which would indicate someone's been fucking around with the airbag when they shouldn't be. Uh, again, just making sure that all of the trim, the roof, the headlining, everything is relatively clean. Again, consistency is what you're looking for. You don't want to see uh, just, you know, the back part of the headlining here uh, very clean and the rest looking a bit dark because that would indicate something leaking up here that someone's just tried to cover up basically. Uh, glove box. You know, th these are little things that I don't really need to show you, but is it secure? Is it rocking from side to side, which will indicate a missing clip? It's little things like that that can suddenly add up and become a real headache, especially if you're OCD about things like I am. Uh, with the vents, are they all free flowing, moving correctly, correct motion? If you're looking at buying a Nissan, chances are uh, these will all be fucked anyway, because, well, if you have a Skyline, you know that the trim around this and basically any Nissan from the 90s started peeling up within just a couple of years of those cars being new. Uh, is all the, the bits and pieces uh, intact? So do you have the trim around um, your center console? Does the ashtray work? Is it full of ash uh, or is it full of rust? Um, does everything function as it should? The emergency uh, release for the automatic transmission, does that work? So right now if I try and shift it, it won't. But if I push this emergency release button and then try and shift it, Sure enough, it works as designed. Uh, center console, is it there? Are both clips in place? Uh, there should be two clips um, there, and if you've got a refrigerated center console, then obviously you'll want to check all of that as well. Um, when we test drive the car, we'll check all the mirrors and the electronics of it. Right now, we're just making sure that everything is complete and in one piece. Uh, the dashboard, is it is it sun damaged? Is it cracked? Is it split? Um, is it any signs of lifting up of this panel underneath here, right at the front of the windscreen, which would indicate like rust, like we said before, uh, coming into the actual metal behind this panel here and popping it up. And uh, just down the A pillars again, you wanna make sure the trim is nicely seated in place that it's not popped out in certain areas, which would indicate uh, front end A pillar uh, repair that hasn't been done properly. This one looks pretty good. Uh, I, I can't be bothered showing you the curtains. I have tints, so I don't use the curtains. Nine out of 10 Super Customs, the electronic curtains won't fully operate and work uh, like they should. This one does, but again, funnily enough, the guy that doesn't use the curtains has the ones that, that actually work. Um, so yeah, you can test the curtains out if you want, uh, but you know, make sure that all the controls and the knobs for your air conditioning and your heater are in place. You're looking for little things like, you know, are you missing the cup holders in the back? Again, ashtray. There is some ash in here. The Japanese love to smoke. I can't blame them because I do as well. Um, so you will more often than not find cars with uh, cigarette smoke in the ashtrays. But that also tells you should, you should be looking at the um, seats and the trim of the car to make sure that they don't have any cigarette burns in them. Forgot a critical component here is the seat belts. Uh, so Obviously you wanna make sure that all the seat belts are in place, pull them out fully, have a really good look uh, to see if there's any frays or rips. Uh, this one has a tiny bit of, uh, it's just lint, uh, but you know, seat belts, uh, if you live somewhere where cars have to be inspected every six months, like New Zealand, where it's fucking stupid to do so because it's such a tiny country, um, then people can be very anal about these and uh, something as small as a seat belt, uh, if you're looking at two or three cars and one has a frayed seat belt, could be the difference between you choosing yes or no to that car, because to find uh, the right seat belt for this vehicle, again, uh, is becoming harder and harder to come by unless you've, you've got um, you know, someone in, in your country or your region that supplies parts for it, like I have for this car, uh, custom coaster conversions, but to find the right seat belt and the right matching color can be a bit of a task, again, Probably best to, to go uh, car shopping with your family, your friends, that way someone can sit in each seat and uh, make sure that all of the seat controls work properly, that it all moves freely and 
and uh, works as designed because there's nothing worse than buying a car only to realize that the recline doesn't work on the passenger seat so your partner can't lie down and put their feet up on the dash. Uh, again, you can test out the, the interior lights by pushing the button, making sure that the interior light goes off and on. And little things, you know, you can, looking for consistency again, this light is obviously not orange, it's bright white. Uh, the interior lights up there are, are bright white. The driver's door light back there is bright white. The lights at the back there are bright white. So um, consistency is what you're looking for. That tells me that someone spent some money on this, someone took some pride in this car. They've uh, replaced all the interior lights with LEDs. And then moving our way back to the interior transmission tunnel and the engine cover, uh, you can pull all this carpet back. Uh, I can't be bothered, but you're feeling for any, any dance, any looseness, because these panels are bolt-on. They can be unbolted. So you're just looking for any looseness. These little uh, plastic clips, should all be in place. Um, just looking for wear and tear. Make sure you lift up the carpets. Make sure that all of the, the trim around is, is holding the carpets in place. Uh, my hands are really dirty now, so I'm, I'm trying not to touch my interior. But you can rotate these seats around. So you want to make sure that the seats can rotate. Let the seats rotate that the seat belts work, that the seat belt uh, clips are there, little things like these um, little uh, little bits of fabric trim that hold the seat belt in place and stop it from dropping down. Making sure that that's all there. Uh, and then having a look obviously at the rear wheel wells as we checked on the outside, you can check it on the inside as well. Give it a tap, make sure it's all nice and solid. Come around to the back of the car, make sure that the rear door latch works. This is the uh, reservoir for the rear windscreen or the rear glass. So make sure that it's got its cap because it's very easy for these to go missing uh, completely. So make sure that's there. Uh, just making sure that everything is routed where it should be. These gas trucks do last a very long time, but they can wear out. Um, they're not the typical sort of $15 gas struts, so nice to have them working. When you're looking at the inside of the rear glass, making sure that the demister uh, uh, ele electronic connections are there and that they're not rusted through. So a lot of times these will rust out. Um, also, the lines for the demister on the back, uh, this one's got tint over it, but if your car doesn't have tint, make sure that all of the lines are intact because if you clean it quite uh, roughly or harshly, um, these are electronic connections and you can basically break those connections and then that line won't demist your window in that area. Again, just checking for corrosion, essentially making sure the boot's all in place where it should be on both sides. Uh, if there's some bits of dodgy wiring, this is from me myself, so I know what that's for. Uh, bits of dodgy wiring, things like that. So just make sure that everything's in place. If the car is being used off-road, this tailgate area, even though it's uh, uh, watertight seal because of this um, weather seal uh, will collect a lot of dust and dirt and it'll sit around these sort of um, latch areas here so you can tell if the car's been off-road. Uh, again if you see bits of silicone this is normal this is uh, a major part of the car where different components come in so it's all seam welded spot welded and then also um, covered up with uh, some liquid sealant so that's pretty normal and uh, just looking back at the tailgate itself will give you a good idea of, as to how the car was used. If this is not ripped or torn, which is very common for these to have tears in them, uh, you know that predominantly it was a passenger vehicle, but if you move further down, you'll see that there's quite a bit of wear here, which will indicate to me that this car was used for some sort of commercial uh, work um, where heavy, sharp items were uh, loaded into the back and have scraped the paint and very distinct sort of sharp marks and dents, uh, which uh, feels in line with the story of this car because when I bought it, um, it didn't actually have back seats in it. So it was a combi vehicle. The rear was used for cargo and the front was uh, for passengers. This one has a storage box. It's just nice to have. Most Limiteds come with this. Uh, living saloons do not. This rear seat is from a Limited, uh, so it's nice to have. 
um, but you do want to make sure that the rear seat cracks on both sides are free and that you can move the seat back and forth as well. So that's basically the mechanical side done. We've had a, a good look at the mechanics of the vehicle underneath and the engine bay. We've had a walk around of the exterior and what to look out for or what I would look out for. Uh, we've had a poke around on the interior. So next up, we're gonna start it up. We're gonna go for a drive, but before we do, we're gonna check all of the electronics in the car uh, to make sure that they're working before we set off. Start the car up. Well, I should have. If the car is cold, I should have mentioned already that you want to check for the glow plug light, but really these use a, a, an afterglow system which won't illuminate the light for more than uh, one or two seconds unless it's minus like five degrees Celsius. Toyota, I've seen on a label written in Japanese and I've had it translated, uh, state that it's okay to crank the engine for up to 30 seconds. I don't like to crank the engine for up to 30 seconds, so when I start my car, that beeping you hear is the alarm telling you that a sunroof is open. It'll happen for each one of the sunroofs, uh, regardless of which one is open. So, well, it lets me know to tell you that you should be hearing out for that. Uh, so what I do when I start the car first thing in the morning is I crank it over, the glow plug light goes off and I just wait for about five seconds and then I crank it over. And it just seems to start so much happier i will put our seatbelt on. And now before we set off on our test drive, we're just gonna make sure that everything works. So we've just tested the sunroofs already. I'm gonna close it now. So that light has gone off, indicating that the sunroof is closed. We're gonna close the number two, which happens in two stages. So it'll come up and then stop automatically. And then you'll push it again. And it'll close, close this one as well. Uh, so the covers for the sunroof um, do not close automatically. They uh, open with the sunroof, but they, you, they needs to be closed manually. Uh, so if you have someone else with you, you can check the lights, obviously. Uh, make sure that they're working and turn the hazards on and uh, have someone standing outside, make sure the brake lights work, make sure the indicators work. Chances are, look, if, if one light isn't working, it's just gonna be a bulb, but if both headlights aren't working, then you should be concerned that Something is not right with it. Um, you can test out the uh, curtains if you want. You have to unclip them, um, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, make sure that your, your wing mirrors uh, work, especially the, the controls to move them up and down. I know that this car works, so I'm not gonna show you. Again, like the curtains, nine out of 10 Super Customs don't have the, um, the wing mirrors retracting working, or the, the retract, nine out of 10 Super Customs don't have the retract function working on both wing mirrors. Again, this car is the anomaly, it works, uh, but you might find that only one of your wing mirrors come in when you hit the retract button. Uh, we're not gonna worry, worry about the stereo because that's easily replaced, um, regardless of what you have. You do wanna check that the air conditioning works, so you wanna turn it on. I'm not gonna uh, uh, change the temperature because it's at 22.5, that should tell me if it's working or not. I'm gonna push your automatic function, uh, and if it's warm outside, you should see the fan come up. If it's cold outside, the fan will turn off. So we're pretty close to 22.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, so the car hasn't gone to maximum fan. It's gone about midway through. I can feel the cold air coming through instantly. I'll turn that off. And I'm gonna turn the rear cooler on. Now I've already got the rear cooler set to uh, max or automatic. And what I'm doing now is I've got my hand over the top vents here. So hot air rises, cold air falls, which is why the heater vents are on the floor for this car and the air conditioning vents are on the roof. And I can feel that my hand is getting very cold now uh, from these vents, which tells me that the air conditioning system is working for the back. Uh, shut that off. I can, uh, during my test drive, uh, turn the temperature all the way up and then make sure that the heater itself is working and I can push the rear heat button and have my friend, or after I've gone for a drive, uh, leave the car running uh, with the rear heater on and go back and on the floor where the rear heater controls are, 
there's a vent and you can put your hand up there and make sure that it's blowing out nice warm air. I know that this car works, but that's something that you might want to check. So we know that all of the electronics are working on the car now, so we need to check the windscreen wipers. That's a windscreen washer. And the wipers will come on automatically when you use the windscreen washer. Uh, for the rear, uh, you turn it up uh, or towards the dash to turn the wipers on. Uh, if you just want to wash it, you use the washer, you turn it down. Or if you want to wash the windscreen with the wipers on, you turn it all the way up. So that's what we're going to do, just make sure it's working. You can see in the wing, I'll just turn the camera around, you can see the liquid coming down and the wiper is doing its work. Uh, it's not so much the wiper that you're worried about if the wipers work or they clean the windscreen properly. Uh, with the older cars, you just want to make sure that the electrical connections are there so that when you activate a switch on, on the control column, that you get an appropriate reaction from what should be working. So we know that everything is working now. The indicators are working, the lights are working, the air conditioning system is working on the front, the heater system is working in the front, AC system in the back works heater system in the back works, our wing mirrors work. Now we're gonna test and make sure that the, the vehicle's uh, automatic park solenoid is working as well. So my foot is off the brake, I'm gonna try change the gears. It's not working. So when the engine is off, we already tested the emergency um, push button to get this automatic uh, transmission selector to move. So now we're gonna try it with uh, putting the brake on and you should be able to hear a little click here. So that click means that the automatic transmission solenoid is working. I've never seen one of these fail on any Toyota. So regardless of how old they are, if that does fail, you'll need to check the brake lights um, because chances of brake lights won't be working and, and you'll have more serious issues. So uh, that's working now. I'm gonna put it back in park and make sure that none of the uh, warning lights on the dashboard are on. So I'm gonna remove the handbrake or take the handbrake off. The light has come off. I'm gonna put it in park, in neutral, sorry. Uh, and we've got the gear indicator lights working down here. The handbrake light has come off. I've got the ECT power button on, so uh, it's electronically controlled transmission. If I turn that off, that comes off. If I turn the overdrive selector off on the gear uh, lever here, the overdrive off light comes on there. Uh, now I'm gonna test the handbrake for its holding strength. I'm gonna try and make this uh, video a little bit faster because I'm running out of battery. Put it in drive, pull the handbrake up, and it's holding the vehicle. I'm gonna give it some accelerator doesn't want to go. So the handbrake is, is nicely adjusted, tells me the car's been maintained properly. Um, so uh, ne next up, what we want to do is just take the car for a drive. Ideally, um, you, you take the car for a, a test drive for a, a good uh, couple of hours at least. Um, the only way to make sure the cooling system, everything's working nicely in the vehicle is to drive it for about four hours. But I understand that that is very uh, unreasonable to ask of uh, if you're going to buy a used car. What I've found in the past is uh, you can offer to fill the guy's tank up uh, and take it for a long drive and also give him a full tank of fuel uh, even if you don't decide to buy the car when you come back. Um, so uh, you can you can always do that um, but when you're test driving the vehicle you can start off at slow speeds, turn the wheel from side to side, you shouldn't hear any clunking noises. Go over a bump. You shouldn't hear any clunking noises. You don't need to drive the car hard to feel clunking noises. You can go from side to side. Get the car up to speed and you want to hit the brakes pretty firmly. So that braked very straight. It didn't pull to either side, which tells you that all of the brake bias is working correctly as it should do. Gingerly rolling along, you're looking out, or you're listening out for any noises or any clunks, any excessive sway in the vehicle. This one is perfectly fine, as I mentioned. Another bump here. And we're on a bit of a dirt road here, and there is no noise coming from the suspension whatsoever. It started clunking and making racketing noises. Uh, you would know to inspect it a little bit further. Stop. Now you want to listen, feel, and look at the rev counter and count through the gears. So overdrive is off. So Second. Third. 
third. And we're not going fast enough for it to go into overdrive, which is uh, essentially poor. All the while, your nose should be sniffing around, not for the owner, but uh, you should be sniffing around for any coolant smells, signs of antifreeze. You should be looking in this wing mirror frequently because at the back there is the exhaust. Is it puffing out smoke, black smoke, every time you put your foot on the accelerator? Was it running relatively cleanly? One thing we didn't test, I'm sorry. Power windows, driver's side is automatic. Does the automatic function work? Even if it doesn't, does the windows work? Passenger side as well, I know it all works. Uh, if the car's being tinted, have a look, put the window down, have a look at the uh, edge of the window here. Uh, you'll be able to tell if it's peeling up or fraying the quality of the workmanship and the tent used. Again, you're constantly smelling for things, you're listening out for the gear changes. There is no lurching when this, this car changes gears. It doesn't suddenly surge or jerk or, or uh, jump back and forth. Um, if you can, uh, you can cover up this instrument binnacle here and turn the headlights on. Uh, and make sure that all of the backlighting on the dashboard is working. I found that regardless of age, Toyota backlighting, um, sorry about that, I found that regardless of age, Toyota backlighting never seems to, to fail. Uh, looking at the temperature gauge, I'm gonna start talking pretty quickly now because we're running out of battery. Temperature gauge uh, should climb progressively and then settle in the middle, so it's not quite up to running temperature yet. There is a, a, a false um, belief that Toyota temperature gauge is uh, incorrect on purpose, that the engineers have calibrated it to give the, the driver peace of mind by not uh, being accurate. So by the time it reads um, that it's overheating, uh, even a little bit, it's, it's going to destroy your engine. That is not correct. Like I always say, uh, would Toyota uh, design something to be like that? Absolutely not. Uh, these cars are old. As they get older, these sort of urban legends come out more and more. Uh, water temperature sensors sit inside water their entire lives. They're very prone to getting uh, crust and crud built up on them. They're very sensitive uh, bits of equipment and um, they can start to read faulty, uh, they can start to send bad data to gauges and the ECU and things like that. In my experience, when they get old and they start to become a bit wonky, they will always read one quarter less than what the actual temperature is. So by the time your gauge gets to uh, three quarters of the way up on the temp, you're actually blazing into the red and overheating. So now during the test drive, when we get to the open road, you're gonna wanna count the gears. So I've got the ECT power on. You can turn it off and see the difference in shift patterns. It'll start shifting up very quickly. When you turn it on, it'll start shifting up very slowly. It'll hold the gears for a lot longer. Um, I like to drive with the ECT power on because it makes it drive like a nor normal modern car. Whereas uh, if you leave the ECT power off, um, it seems to run more like uh, in economy mode in a normal modern car where it changes way too quickly for my liking. Now you can give it a, a bit of a bootful uh, and see if the uh, transmission will kick down. So we'll wait until it goes into overdrive or fourth there. Now I'm going to give it a bit of a bootful and we're looking at the gauge or feeling for any lurchiness. We're going to look for smoke in the back there. So, and a little bit of smoke came out. That's normal. Uh, but she kicked down very smoothly and suddenly uh, uh, lifted up her skirt and, and got moving. So again, just, just what you want. That responsiveness tells you that the ECU for the automatic transmission is working as designed. What I won't show you now is uh, what you need to do is get onto the motorway, the highway, get it up to 100, 110 kilometers an hour and feel and count the gears to make sure your torque converter is locking up. So you should count from first to second, second to third, third, th third into overdrive with the overdrive on and then at 80 kilometers an hour you're looking out for once the car gets up to running temperature for the rev counter to drop from about two and a half thousand to about 2,100 RPM. 
and you'll suddenly start building speed without the rev counter flaring up. Like if I put my foot down now, see that rev counter flare up? So you're not looking for that. That's not what you want. Um, when the torque converter locks up after 82 kilometers an hour, it will start building speed without the rev counter flaring. It'll just be a very steady climb. That means your torque converter is locked up and that's how you want it to be. Uh, also, uh, you can turn the ECT power off at running temperature. And I don't believe this is at full running temperature yet. Uh, if you want to test the torque converter lockup uh, under highway speeds, get to 60 kilometers an hour, turn overdrive off. And did you see that flare? So that was torque converter locked up. So it's not locked up anymore. I'm gonna get, there's a red light coming now and a 1% battery. Won't be able to show you, but you'll see this lock up now. That was torque converter lock up. So you know that the torque converter is locking up. It'll only happen at full running temperature. Um, and that is my uh, rough guide on, on what I would look out for when buying a higher super custom.